Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first Meet, Meet the Mentor session of GESF 2017. Uh, we're here today uh, for a session that's a little different than your typical conference session. Uh, we're joined by Thomas Freeman, who really needs no introduction, but internationally acclaimed and recognized journalist, columnist, reporter, author, winner of three Pulitzer Prizes, uh, seven best-selling books, from, including From Beirut to Jerusalem, The World is Flat, and his most recent book, Thank You for Being Late. The Meet, Tour, the, Meet the Mentor sessions uh, allow you to connect with leading thinkers from around the world to share their experiences, their successes, what's affected their lives, and how they've come as far as they've come. We'll have the opportunity to hear uh, from Mr. Freeman tomorrow at one of the plenary sessions where he'll talk more about the global landscape, geopolitics, and so many of the topics he is expert on. But this morning, we really want to take the opportunity to learn about his career path, his experience, and how that has influenced him and how education has influenced him in his lifetime. Uh, I want to start off talking about education, talking about teachers. The Varkey Foundation has coined the hashtag, Teachers Matter. And, and I know my favorite teachers, and my favorite teachers matter. Fred Arnold was my art teacher and my student government advisor. And uh, he reminded me that art's not an easy B, but also taught us a lot about life, a lot about discipline, a lot about working hard. Mr. Freeman, you had a teacher that helped share your life uh, in room 313 at St. Louis Park High School in Minnesota. Can you tell us how your favorite teacher helped shape your career? Well, Justin, thank you. It's great to be here with you. And uh, I want to thank the Varkey Foundation for inviting me here and putting on this amazing event. Um, yeah, I actually got my start in journalism. I've actually uh, only taken one journalism course in my life. Um, uh, and it was in room 313 at St. Louis Park High School, where I grew up outside of uh, small town outside of Minneapolis, really a suburb. And um, uh, it was in 10th grade, uh, so I was 15 at the time. And uh, we had a legendary journalism teacher, her name was Hattie Steinberg. And um, uh, she really, um, as I said, her class is the only journalism course I've ever taken, not because I was that good, but because she was that good. And I uh, really never needed one afterwards. Now this was uh, 1960, 768 um, that year. And it was a pretty unstable time in America. Kennedy assassination, Martin Luther King, Vietnam War. And um, Hattie was a, um, was a woman of certainty and strong values uh, in an age of uncertainty. And she was the opposite of cool. Um, she was a single woman in her 60s. Um, but we, um, flocked to her classroom like, like it was the malt shop, and she was Wolfman Jack, okay? Um, and I've often reflected on why that was, and it was because she imparted really strong values and fundamentals, um, how you uh, approach an interview, what you wear to an interview, uh, basic lessons of journalism about plagiarism or how to construct a, an interview. I got my first, in fact, lesson from her. Um, we interviewed an ad man, um, a local guy who ran a big ad agency, and he used a four-letter word in the interview. And we had a big debate at the editorial staff meeting. Do we quote this four-letter word in our high school newspaper? And she insisted that we must. And he almost got fired. Um, and, uh, and that was a lesson to me about four-letter words, um, which you won't hear any of today. Uh, but in the age of Twitter, those kind of things really, really matter. So I took her course in 10th in, uh, in grade, and um, I kind of got interested in the Middle East and journalism at the same time, and um, uh, started taking, actually, Arabic as a freshman in college. And I wrote for my college paper a little bit, but I really got my start um, uh, in journalism. I, I went to graduate school uh, in England. Um, uh, I had a Marshall Scholarship to go to Oxford. But I actually spent my first year at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, where I met my then girlfriend, now wife, who's from Des Moines, Iowa. 
1975, Jimmy Carter was running against Gerald Ford for president. And uh, we were in London, we were walking down the street one day, and the Evening Standard, you know, the afternoon newspaper there, always has a blaring headline, you know, Brad to Jen, we're finished, or something like that, to get you to buy the newspaper. And, um, and that day there was some blaring headline about the Middle East that struck me as ironic. And um, I have no idea what possessed me, but I went back to my dorm room in London, and I wrote a column about it. And um, just on my own, no one asked me to. I, I don't know where it came from, but I wrote a column about it. And my then girlfriend, now wife, happened to be the neighbor of the op-ed page editor of the Des Moines Register in Des Moines, Iowa. And she took it home on spring break and gave it to the neighbor op-ed page editor of the Des Moines Register. And he liked it, and he printed it on a half page of the Des Moines Register with a cartoon. And they paid me $50. <laughs> and I thought that was the coolest thing in the whole world. I had been walking down the street. I had an opinion. I wrote it down. And someone paid me $50. <laughs> and I was completely hooked ever after. And um, so actually, during my time at Oxford, I wrote a, uh, about 10 op-ed pieces about um, the Middle East and foreign policy for the Des Moines Register and the Minneapolis Star and Tribune. And so when I went to apply for a job when I graduated, I, I uh, applied at AP and UPI, United Press International, the wire services. And AP looked at my, all I had were these 10 op-ed articles. And uh, they said, you've never covered a fire, which was true. I'd never covered a city hall meeting. But I had 10 op-ed pieces about international relations. And they said, you know, basically forget it. And, uh, but UPI, being a little more entrepreneurial and kind of Avis to AP's Hertz, uh, took a chance on me, because uh, I studied Arabic at Oxford, and the Iranian Revolution happened, and they thought the same squiggles, letters, Iran, Arab world, didn't matter. So um, <laughs> if I know those squiggles, I could figure out these squiggles. And, um, uh, and they hired me in London on Fleet Street, and that's where I got my start. But it all really started at room 313 with Hattie Steinberg at St. Louis Park High. That's, that's great. And interesting you touch on that, and there's many journalists out there who report uh, who break news, who investigate, and you've done a little bit of all of that yeah. aco across your career, but what you've really chosen to do in your first book, uh, Beirut to Jerusalem, which is in 25 different languages and frequently found in high school and college classrooms mm -hmm. around the globe, really does, it's a textbook, it really informs you are not just reporting, you are distilling information, complex information to help people understand things, to educate them. Why do you think that that is an important role as part of journalism to really sort of break down so many of the interesting things and the confluence of things around the world and help people understand things from different points of view? So um, everybody goes into journalism for different reasons. Some people want to be investigative reporters, business reporters, sports reporters, cover the White House. Um, I went into journalism because I really enjoy being a translator from English to English. That's what I do for a living. Um, I really enjoy taking really complex subjects and breaking them down so, first of all, I can understand them. Uh, and then if I can understand them, share them with other people. And I happen to think that that's a very noble um, reason to go into journalism because the more complex the world gets, um, the more uh, it becomes easy for political figures to indulge in conspiracy theories, um, to uh, you know, make the world more complicated than it is, and that um, uh, Marie Curie uh, once said, you know, uh, if if people understand more, they will fear less. And so I think today the need to uh, be a translator from Arabic to Arabic, from English to English, from French to French, from Russian to Russian, so people aren't overwhelmed by the complexity of the world and. Um, given over to uh, you know, leaders um, who would engage in conspiracy theories, um, uh, really more important than ever. Um, so that's really what's motivated me and uh, to go into to journalism. And my books, whether it's The World is Flat or Thank You for Being Late, they're all really uh, efforts to be a translator from English to English. Both in, in journalism and education, uh, 
what you just what you just said in terms of helping people understand things. It's all moving faster, and you talk about in your books Moore's Law and yeah. how the speed of processors doubles every two years, and our access to information has grown greater and greater over the last certainly the last decade. Education is one of those things that people see as moving slowly and it's and slow to affect change in both the nature that you have K to 12 systems that to see the outcomes takes 10, 12 years to really materialize, but also in, in policy and in the disaggregation of systems, school systems around the world. How do you see education trying to keep up with the flow of information and how do you see your role as sort of a, as an educator, as a journalist, yeah coming up with stories, explaining things in a timely manner before people can jump ahead of you and get a scoop ahead of you and, mm -hmm. and misrepresent things, yeah. as you might say. Well, it's a, it's a good question, Justin. So I'll talk a little about this tomorrow, but I'll just take a little slice out for people who are here, because my, my new book um, really is about, it begins with me explaining to my parking garage attendant, <laughs> who um, confesses to me one day that he actually has his own blog um, uh, and asked me for advice. And uh, the book begins with me giving my parking garage attendant in Bethesda, Maryland, a tutorial on how to write a column. And um, uh, I explained to him that a news story is meant to inform. Uh, I could write a story about the conference here, and, and, and uh, the, you all would tell me whether I inform better or worse. Uh, but a column, an opinion piece, is meant to provoke. So I'm either in the heating business or the lighting business. That's what I do. I either do a heating or a lighting, okay? I'm either stoking up an emotion in you or I'm illuminating something for you. And if I really do it well, I do both and produce either heat or light or ideally heat and light. Uh, but I explained that to produce heat and light actually requires a chemical reaction. And you have to combine three chemicals. Uh, the first is, what's your value set? What is the set of values you're trying to promote? Are you a communist, a capitalist, a neocon, a neoliberal, a libertarian, a Marxist, a Keynesian? What is the set of values as an opinion person you're trying to promote in the world? Second, how do you think the machine works? So the machine is my shorthand for what are the biggest forces shaping more things in more places in more ways on more days? Because I think to be an effective columnist or educator, you have to have a take on the world. So all my books are really my own latest thinking on how, how I think the main gears and pulleys of the world work. Because as a columnist, you're trying to take your values and push the machine. And if you don't know how the machine works, you either won't push it or you'll push it in the wrong direction. So it's very important to have a take on how you think the world uh, is being shaped. And, um, so what my new book is about is I, I think that's what's shaping more things in more ways and in, in more places on more days is we're actually in the middle of three nonlinear accelerations all at the same time with the three largest forces on the planet, which I call the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. So the market for me is digital globalization, not your grandfather's globalization. That was containers on ships or planes. That's actually flat. But digital globalization, where everything's being digitized and globalized, whether it's through Facebook or Twitter or PayPal or MOOCs, if you put digital globalization on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. Uh, Mother Nature is climate change, biodiversity loss, and population growth. If you put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. And Moore's Law, uh, coined by Gordon Moore in 1965, the co-founder of Intel, says that the speed and power of microchips will double every 24 months. It's now closer to 30, but never mind. That's actually the driver of all technology. If you put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. We're actually in the middle of three hockey stick accelerations all at the same time with the three largest forces on the planet, and they're all interacting with each other. More Moore's Law drives more globalization. More globalization drives more climate change and more solutions to all of, all of these problems. So that's how I think the machine works. The third chemical is what you've learned about people and culture. Because there's no column without people. And there are no people without culture. So I think to be an effective columnist, you have to mix all three together. What is your value set? How you think the machine works? And how you think the machine is affecting people and culture? And how people and culture are coming back and affecting the machine and you? Stir those together, let it bake. 
rise for 45 minutes, and if you do it right, you'll produce a column that produces either heat or light. And you'll know by the reaction you get from people. They'll read your column and say, I didn't know that. It's a good reaction. Uh, they'll read your column and say, I never looked at it that way. You gave them light. That's a good reaction. Uh, they'll read your column and say, I never connected those things. That's a good reaction. Your favorite, you live for this, happens four times a year. They'll read your column and say, Mr. Friedman, you said exactly what I felt, but didn't know how to say. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, they'll read your column and say, I want to kill you dead, you and all your offspring, OK? <laughs> That's a heat. Um, uh, so any of those will tell you that you've uh, written a column that uh, has produced heat or light. And um, so what I really try to do with each column is, uh, is that. And um, it's so important now, Justin, because uh, what these three accelerations are doing um, in shorthand is that um, uh, they're producing what John Hagel, uh, this wonderful Deloitte um, uh, management consultant, calls the big shift. So what is the big shift? The big shift is that um, 30 years ago, we lived in a world of stocks, OK? So what did you want to do as a country or a person? You wanted to hoard, you wanted to stock up on as many stocks as you could whether it was natural resources or certain industry, and then you spent them and dined out on them for 30 years. As a student, what you wanted to do was go to college for four years, fill your cheeks and head you know, with all this knowledge, as much as you could cram in there in four years, and then spend it over the next 30 in your job. And you could live in a world of stocks because the world was slow, it was a world of walls, so actually things didn't change because these accelerations weren't going on. And so what you learned in those four years actually could shape your career for many years. Well, what's happened in the age of accelerations is we've moved from a world of stocks to a world of flows, OK? So now the way you get rich as a country and a person, Dubai is a manifestation of this. So you want to put yourself in the middle of as many flows as you can. Because you can't possibly stock up on as much knowledge that's being generated now. The key is to put yourself in the flow. And therefore, the only way you can be a lifelong employee now is if you are a lifelong learner. That if you are lifelong in the flow. And I think that's the biggest challenge for every worker every student, every education institution, because it means educating people a little differently. It means educa you know, educating people to really want to be part of flows. And by the way, not just draw from them, but contribute to them. Because the more you contribute, the more you'll draw. And um, to nurture curiosity, to nurture um, love of learning. If you're not educating people for a job that hasn't been invented yet, you're not educating people. Because that's the only value uh, education you could have. Because jobs are churning and changing so much faster. So to keep with your analogy of the flow and, and look towards journalism, you make a very compelling argument for columnists, yeah. for helping people understand things, for provoking to shine light on things or to start fires. As people are sort of in the flow now and trying to you know, keep up, tread water, not get swept away, when they're looking at news and journalism today, how do you think, how do you recommend individuals best judge uh, what's a column? You're very transparent about this, yeah. and I think people see you as a right. columnist. And what's just simply reporting or breaking news or investigative reporting? How do they not let the flow take them away and identify where there's a blend between the story on the front page, it's just the facts, right. and where someone's interjecting either education or opinion? Well, you know, there's a challenge. Um, in, you know, when I grew up, there were just three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS. There was basically the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post. And at the New York Times, we have a very clear wall. You know, our opinions are on the opinion page, and the news is on the news page. But now we live in a world where um, anyone can be a columnist. I can start TomFriedman.com tomorrow. 
um, I can, you know, declare my, my parking guy um, told me his Google metrics say he's read in 30 countries. It's my parking attendant. Now you have to love a parking attendant who knows his Google metrics, you know. Um, but uh, so in that kind of world, the values I learned in Hattie Steinberg's classroom at 313, uh, my parking attendant is from Ethiopia, God bless him, but he didn't, he didn't go to that class, you know what I mean? So that, that line between opinion and fact now is everywhere. So I, um, uh, I think we have a real challenge. We as news people have a challenge, but I think much more we as citizens and teachers have a challenge. Um, because uh, there's just this fire hose now of, of flows coming from all directions. And what many people don't understand is that the internet, which is the mother of all fire hoses, um, is actually an open sewer of untreated, unfiltered information. And so our, it's now at the center, this open sewer is now at the center of our lives. It's where we educate, where we communicate, where we find a date, where we find a spouse, where we do our business, buy our books. But it's actually an open sewer. And so if you aren't building the filters into your students and citizens for how you filter the diamonds and the gold nuggets that are also in that sewer from the cans and boots and, you know, um, uh, and rusted nails, we have a big problem. We have a huge challenge. And so one of the things I advocate in, in my book, I, I believe we, that digital civics needs to be, I don't, I'm not interested in teaching kids coding. I'm much more interested in teaching them digital civics. How do I actually read something on the internet and determine whether it's true? How do I think horizontally, not just vertically? How do I triangulate that? Justin Cooper, you know, was this or that. How do I find out where that's really true? You know, my Wikipedia profile, frankly, has been completely taken over by uh, Tom Friedman haters. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I have no idea who this person is. That is my Wikipedia profile. Now, if you just said, if, there, if that was the only thing about me on the net, so what I did, actually, I wrote my own bio. Um, and uh, so it's a real problem, because it's true of so many things. And so I think we have to teach young people from day one that to say to the teacher, but, 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 but I read it on the internet, doesn't exactly settle the bar bet, you know? That just because it comes in this patina of technology doesn't mean that it's true. And we also have to teach them digital civics, because what's going on, and President Trump, frankly, is a manifestation of this, is life is now imitating Twitter. So people now talk to each other like they talk to each other on Twitter. Um, so I'm actually, if you're talking to me on Twitter, I have to warn you, I'm not there. I do not look at Twitter at all. So if you're trying to communicate with me there, by the way, if you're trying to communicate with me there on Facebook, I'm not there either. And by the way, I've never smoked a cigarette. And my plan is to die saying all three, OK? Because um, I think anything said about me in 142 characters by an anonymous person is a sign of the apocalypse, OK? I'm just not interested. And um, so uh, that's why my book is called Thank You for Being Late. Because it's a celebration of everything old and slow. Because I think the faster the world gets, the more important becomes everything you cannot download, but everything you have to upload the old-fashioned way through good teacher, good student, good spiritual leader, good, you know, uh, um, uh, good student, through, through good government, good citizen. All this old stuff, the faster the world gets, these values, they actually matter more than ever. And so my, my book is a celebration and a reaffirmation of everything old and slow. And that is how I live my life. Uh, so I'm a, I talk the talk of globalization. I really want to understand it, of technology. I do not walk the walk. If you're talking to me on Twitter, you're talking to yourself. Well, I, I certainly appreciate the differentiation. And you and I may be the two least connected people at this conference, because I'm not on Facebook yeah. or Twitter either. And when you talk about values, we're joined today uh, by Sonny Varkey, who is the founder of the Varkey Foundation, the founder Sonny, of James Education. We, we thank you for hosting this great conference today. And, and 
Mr. Varkey entered education because his family was in education, and, and your family's in education. Yes. And so I think for so many people here who, who care about the space, I think just to be interesting to hear, you know, your wife, Anna, is a, yeah. is a first grade teacher outside of Washington, D.C. Right. Your daughter was in Teach for America. Your wife is chair of yeah. a program in Washington, D.C. to help uh, inner city youth with college prep. Could you talk a little bit about how, how, what it's like living with, with educators. I'm surrounded um, by teachers. And, and, and how, it, is that, how has that affected you? Everybody's correcting my grammar all the time. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, well, you know, my wife uh, was a first grade reading teacher um, for many years in the public school system. And uh, my wife and I both went to public school. And, um, uh, uh, and our daughters did too. We live outside of Washington, D.C. And my older daughter uh, runs the Khan Academy Lab School lower school in Mountain View, because um, Sal Khan, the founder of Khan Academy, actually started a lab school in the basement of Khan Academy when his kids became school age, and he didn't like the choices. So he decided to start his own school. And um, uh, my daughter, who did do Teach for America in DC, and then was a DC public school teacher, and then went to Stanford Business School, happened to graduate right at the time he was starting his school, and uh, Sal hired her blessedly, and, and um, she now is the school director of, of, of the lower school there and helped design his very cutting edge uh, education. And one of the things that's cool about it, I think, is um, uh, part of their system is that every student basically has a contract with their teacher, what they want to accomplish that week, that month, and that year. Now for the younger students, it's really done for them. And as the students get older, um, they take more and more of a role of writing their own contract. And there's one thing the kids at the Khan Lab School will know when they graduate, and that is they own their own education. And to me, there's nothing more important than that. The older I get, the more I've come to believe that the two most important words in life are self and sustaining. That if, if, if things aren't self-sustaining because they're driven by ownership, um, you know, when they bury me six feet under, I hope they put on my tombstone just one phrase, which to me, again, really has guided my whole life, that in the history of the world, no one has ever washed a rented car. I'm a huge believer in that. In the history of all mankind, no one has ever washed a rented car. And no one's ever washed a rented country, no one's ever washed a rented education, no one's ever washed a rented job. When ownership is in the room, when a teacher owns their classroom, when a student owns their own education, good things happen that are self-sustaining. And when ownership is not in the room, bad things happen. And so education, what I learned growing up around teachers, and I'm, I have a huge, therefore, affection for teachers, and I do have an allergy for um, uh, rich hedge fund managers who come in and want to tell teachers how to run their classroom when they've never gone to public school themselves or even stood in front of a group of students. So I hope I'm not, or actually I hope I am insulting someone here, um, because uh, I'm, I'm a big believer that before you do that, stand in a classroom. So my daughter went through the Michelle Re reforms. She was there for the whole Michelle Re era of reform in the Washington, D.C system and when people rail about the teachers union, and teachers union has a lot of problems, but there are a lot of different teachers unions out there, um, they might want to ask themselves, what would it be like at their hedge fund if five times a year a total stranger walked into their office, watched them for 30 minutes, then evaluated them, and half their pay was on the basis of that evaluation? Um, a little humility here is in store. Teachers are the greatest education philanthropists in the world. The number of cupcakes, donuts, crayons, and pens, you know, my family has donated to public school and every one of the other teachers there. So I have a huge affection for how difficult it is to stand in front of a classroom and actually teach young people and do it year in and year out. It's a really hard job. I saw how it burned out my wife and my, and my daughter, frankly. And so what I, my view of education is very simple. It's 95% about parenting and 5% about everything else. You give me parents who take an interest and ownership in their kids' education, and I'll make every good teacher better, and I'll make every great teacher fantastic. And without that, the idea that I can send my kids to your school 
and I can drop out, and you now are responsible for my kid's education during those six hours of the day, and what happens the other 18, I don't have to take an interest in. You know, I really sharpened that opinion when I went to Shanghai to the um, Shanghai Middle School that scored number one in the PISA exam. And I got to interview the um, leadership of the school and several teachers. And I said, so tell me, what's the secret? What's the secret? Your kids stand on their head uh, for eight hours a day, five days, you know, so the blood rushes to their brain. So they, what, what's the secret? How, how do you do this? And they basically said the secret is that there is no secret. It's all just good fundamentals. And then at the end of the day, I was walking out of the school and I noticed there's like a huge throng of parents at the gate. They don't let them in. And it um, uh, turns out those parents are there every day to collect their kids. And they talk so much about their interaction with the parents, how they educate the parents to help educate their kids and all of these things. So that's the secret. And, um, uh, and parents who take an interest in their kids' education, ask them every day what they're learning, what was their favorite subject, are you onto your homework, are you reading books, um, uh, get your nose out of you know, Facebook and, and into a book, um, give me better parents and everything else will take care of itself. Uh, in, in the spirit of being more inclusive and, and giving everyone some buy-in, we're going to open the floor in a few minutes to questions from all of you here so you can start to think about what you would like to ask this morning. And you've touched on a few different things that I want to try to draw some things together. It, it's interesting, I was in a school here yesterday in Dubai, and one of the things they do with parents is they welcome them in. They don't mm -hmm. just want you to drop off or yeah. wait outside the gate. They have put a coffee shop literally in the foyer of the school Great so that idea. parents come yeah. and interact and take more activity. So it's a, it's a very yeah. interesting comment. Great idea. When, when uh, you touched on this a little bit earlier, that you sort of speak English to people who speak English, right. and speak Arabic right. to people who speak Arabic. Yeah. All of your columns this year in the New York Times have focused on President Trump. Sometimes it even sounds like instead of explaining him to other people, you're almost explaining him to himself. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> uh, you, you clearly think this is important because you've, you've, as I said, you've focused all of your comms on it so far this yeah. year. How do you, when you're outside of the U.S., and, yeah, and obviously still inside the U.S., help to explain to people what the sediments are in America and where we are politically that there is a little, there is division, and you talk about it in the UK too, there's sure. division over Brexit. Right. And, and this isn't necessarily a political question one way or the other, but more about understanding there's people have different understandings and different perceptions and come at things from different angles as you were earlier explaining. So it's a good question, Justin. I, I'm gonna avoid sort of the politics of Trump. Anyone who wants to know what I think about him can read my column. Um, and, uh, but let's talk about where this came from. That's a much more important subject. Um, and I think Brexit, Marine Le Pen, Trump, they're all part of a, of, of a, of a moment in history. And um, uh, I'll talk a little about this again tomorrow, so apologies to anyone who will be there, but um, uh, you have to understand, in, in my view, uh, something very important happened in 2007. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the hardest things for people to appreciate is an acceleration, because we rarely, and an exponential, excuse me, because we rarely experience an exponential in our lives. Um, the engineers at Intel once tried to explain the Moore's Law exponential. What happens when you keep doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling something? And so to demonstrate it to people, they took a 1971 VW Beetle, and they said, what if this VW Beetle improved at the same rate microchips did under Moore's Law? What would it be like today? And they determined that that beetle today would go 300,000 miles an hour, it would get two million miles per gallon, and it would cost four cents. That's the power of the technological exponential we're in the middle of. Now, technology moves up in steps. So you get mainframe computer, that creates a new platform, people scale around it, it produces another technology, the PC goes up, and that's how technology improves. And then we get different kind of jobs and skills and capabilities. But not all steps are created equal. Sometimes you get a really monster step. And I believe that happened in 2007. Now, I know that sounds like a completely innocuous year. 2007, what's this guy talking about? 
But here's what happened in 2007. The year was kicked off at the Moscone Center in San Francisco when Steve Jobs unveiled the first iPhone. January 2007, beginning a process by which we're putting in the hands, now of about half the people on the planet, a handheld computer that doubles as a phone connected to the internet with more compute power than the Apollo space mission. That's how the year started. In 2007, a company called Facebook, um, actually late 2006, opened its platform to anyone with a registered email address. So it broke out of high schools and universities, and in 2007, it went global. In 2007, a company called Twitter split off on its own independent platform and went global. In 2007, the most important software you've never heard of, probably, called Hadoop, uh, named after the founder's son's toy elephant, uh, was launched into the wild. Hadoop is what enables a million computers to work together like they're one. That's called big data. Uh, that launched in 2007. Hadoop didn't invent it. It was really in the, the, codes, the core source codes were invented by Google. But as Doug Cutting, the founder of Hadoop, explains in the book, Google lives in the future and sends us letters back home. And what Google did was leave a trail of breadcrumbs for the open source software community to reverse engineer what it had done. And the free open public version of that became Hadoop and it became available to the world. In 2007, a guy up in Seattle named Jeff Bezos launched the world's first ebook reader called the Kindle. In 2007, a company called Google bought a little known TV company called YouTube. And in 2007, this same company called Google launched its own operating system into the wild called Android. Uh, in 2007, IBM launched the world's first cognitive computer called Watson. In 2007, three design students in San Francisco were attending the design conference that year. And they noticed that all the hotel rooms were sold out. And one of them had three spare air mattresses. And they thought, why don't we just rent out these air mattresses in our apartment? And it worked out so well. In 2007, they started a company called Airbnb. Uh, in 2007, the world, for the first time, actually late 2006, crossed a billion users on the internet. And in 2007, for the first time, people sent more text to SMS messages on their phones than voice. Uh, in 2007, the cloud was born. In 2007, solar energy took off. In 2007, a process for extracting natural gas from tight shale called fracking began. In 2007, Intel, for the first time, went off silicon to extend the Moore's Law exponential and introduce non-silicon materials into its microchips. In 2007, Michael Dell, who retired in 2005, decided he better come back to work in 2007. Turns out 2007 may in time be understood as the single greatest technological inflection point since Gutenberg invented the printing press. And we completely missed it because of 2008. So right when our physical technologies just took off, like we're on a moving sidewalk in an airport that went from 5 to 50 miles an hour, right when that happened, all of our social technologies the political reform, the regulatory reform, the learning reform, the political reform you needed to go with that, the institutional reform that you needed to go with that completely froze. And a lot of people got caught in that disjunction. So here's my short history of the world and work from 1945 to the present. From 1945 to 19, I'm speaking now as an American. 1945 to 1980, I have a congressman from Minnesota where I grew up who said if you were a white male in Minnesota from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you needed a plan to fail. You actually needed a plan to fail. There was such an updraft of white collar and blue collar work, high wage, middle skilled, high wage, middle skilled jobs, because we had a lot of law, wall, walls of protection, you actually needed a plan to fail. Then the 80s come. We get the mainframe computer globalization starts, and the IT revolution starts. We don't really adapt in America, but what do we do? We give a lot of people hammers to build houses. We give them visa cards to go into debt. We give them home mortgages to borrow against. 
and to ride the value of their homes up through the baby boom, and we let their wives work. And so we keep the American dream alive with all these techniques. We, we enable them to, in effect, have high-wage, middle-skilled jobs without actually the learning. And then think what's hap what happens in 2007, 2008. In 2007, machines, software, automation suddenly start to devour white-collar and blue-collar work, middle-skilled, at a rate we have never seen before. And China, which joins the World Trade Organization in 2001, can suddenly, with trade, come. And these two trains collided in rural America and rural England and really disrupted a lot of people. And then in 2008, we took away their mortgages. <laughs> and we not only bankrupted a lot of people, but we, we made their homes underwater so they couldn't move where jobs were. They couldn't move to the city. And the collision of 2007, 2008, I believe, created the foundation of Brexit, of Trumpism, just completely disrupted and unmoored a lot of people. And suddenly, this thing that has sustained the American dream and the British dream and the French dream called the high-wage, middle-skilled job disappeared. So now there's a high-wage, high-skilled job. There's a low-wage, low-skilled job. But high-wage, middle-skilled job, no such animal in the zoo anymore. And the challenge, therefore, for education is profound. Thank you for that. I can ruin any dinner party. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I do I th weddings, bar mitzvahs, whatever you like. Um, I'm freely available. Just call my agent. I thought your new book was um, supposed to be optimistic. <laughs> yeah, optimistic right, yeah. about the future. Uh, I'd like to open the floor now to questions. Yep. Uh, we'll go around. I think we have some runners with some microphones. Please, uh, when, you, when you ask your question, uh, try to uh, keep it as a question, not a speech. And please tell us your name and where you're from. Start with this gentleman right here. Uh, my name. Okay, it'll be on. Hello, yeah. Hi. My name is Sharad Agarwal. I represent uh, digital media, mm -hmm. not fake news. Uh -huh, good. My question is, how does America repair its image for the rest of the world? What does America have to do to uh, bring back things to where they were? What do you, th uh, can I return the question on you before I answer it? Yeah. What do you, th and I mean this seriously, this yeah. is not to be cute. Yeah. What do you think our image is now? Um, I thought Americans were smart people up until you guys elected Trump. Mm -hmm. I hope I've answered the question. Yeah, no, interesting, yeah, interesting. Um, uh, next question back there, somebody was yeah. raising their hand. <laughs> was it you or was it you? I think I saw somebody raise their hand. Uh, you know, um, democracy is an unpredictable thing. And um, uh, when people are really uh, hurting, they will, they will do really, um, They'll make uh, bets. They'll take risks that you wouldn't see in normal time. And I think that um, that's what a lot, of, a lot of people were hurting. You know, um, I'm writing in, in now a new afterword for my book. It's going to come out in paperback in, um, in October. And um, my friend Don Baer pointed this out to me. A lot of, a lot of uh, commentary said Americans wanted change. First, they tried change with Obama. Then they try to change with Trump, you know. Um, but that's actually not true. I think they want help, OK? Because I think they understand that this age of accelerations is just overwhelming. And um, uh, when people are desperate for help, they'll, they'll, they'll do desperate things. And so um, uh, that's, that's where he came from. And, and, uh, I, I argued against him. I said, I don't think he'll actually help the people he claims he's going to help and who need help. But um, uh, they were ready to roll the dice. And, and we have to sort of be a cognizant of that. But thanks for your question. Yeah, just go back and forth. Yeah, yeah we'll go to this side first. Go yeah. ahead. Okay. Hi, Lisa Parisi from New York. Uh huh. I thought we were smart too, but <laughs> yeah, thank didn't you, yeah. turn out that way. Um, there are a number of things that you're saying about um, education and, and what's 
at, way back at the beginning of what, right. when you were talking, um, that 95% of, of expectations right. really needs to come from the parents. Yes. But the reality is yeah. that's not who we teach. Right. Um, so, you know, like, I guess it's my belief that I can, because I feel teacher? I am. Yeah, of course okay. I am. Yeah. And I feel like I can be the parent. Right, yes. Because I am. Right. I'm a parent and yeah. a psychiatrist right. and a nurse yeah. and, you know, everything. Sure. And, and there are situations where children come out of places where right. sure they don't have parents yeah. and they, they're very successful. So how do we get that? Right. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's adequate enough to say It's got to be parents, yeah. Right. Parents, step it up. But. Um, well, we might have a debate about that, but um, my, my wife um, uh, was chairman of the Seed School Foundation in Washington, which is one of the four schools in Waiting for Superman. And because um, you're asking a very important question, and it really is built on the question you're asking. So SEED is a, um, uh, a charter public boarding school. So kids actually leave the neighborhood, leave the home from kindergarten to 12th grade, and they're housed on our campus. And they, in effect, create a surrogate family and a surrogate system of parenting. So I, I still think I'm right about the parenting, but you're right that we, yeah. Yeah, but no, you, I, and I, I understand what you're saying, and that's why I think we need all these different models that f try to substitute for that, um, that lacuna, that, that, that absence in so many contexts. Um, I, I, and, and you know, some kids are just, they're just born adaptive and they thrive and we know, and some kids aren't, and, um, and they need more uh, scaffolding. Um, and I think that how we provide that through after school or models like SEED, we're actually boarding kids. You're taking them out of dangerous situations, homes and neighborhoods, and, and giving them a kind of stability. I think very important. That's why I'm for, I'm for trying everything. But I am a, a big public school advocate. I think that's a really huge socializing, pluralizing institution. And I'm horrified uh, by, 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 by this, this, this view of these people. I think it's really bad and needs to be fought at every turn. Yeah, please. My name is Nandita. Uh huh. Where are you from? My name is Nandita. I'm a wordsmith and storyteller from India. Uh huh. Uh, what has been your most unforgettable experience in the Middle East? Well, um, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, Uh, the question was, when will my book be out in paperback? And thank you very much. It's October, and thank you so much for asking. I really, really appreciate it. No, the, the question was, um, what's my most forget un unforgettable story? You know, um, you know most of them are, are pretty bad, because I, I, I saw a lot of, I was in Beirut from 1979 to 1984. You know, um, you know I'll, I'll answer you, your, your question uh, more generally than a specific one, because I can't think of, there were so many. Um, what I uh, enjoyed, and I put that in inverted commas, about being in Beirut from 1979 to 1984, that's, was the middle of a civil war, Israeli invasion, marine bombing, sovereign chitil, all of these things, is that um, you get to see how human beings behave at high temperatures. Very rare any of us get to see that. Um, and as a journalist, very rare. So you get to see people under extreme pressure. And, um, and what you learn, therefore, you, you, you get the full boundaries and rainbow of human experience. And you see incredible acts of depravity that you never thought human beings are capable of. And you see amazing acts of kindness by the same people or different people in the same situation. And so as a journalist, I learned more in my five years in Beirut than in the previous 26 years before that and the you know, 30 years after. And because and, uh, you, you rarely have that kind of experience where you get to see what human beings are capable of for good and for ill. And that's what stayed with me you know, all these years. Up there, we'll try you. Just shout your question or we can, oh, I guess they need the microphone. Hi, uh, my name is Rohit. I actually write for the Global Leaders Foundation based here in, it's an NGO uh -huh. based here. 
Um, so I actually had to make a point to you. I rented a car and I actually washed it before I gave it back. <laughs> it's Every only because audience, I believe... there's one guy who washed a rented car. <laughs> well, I just, I just believe that uh, yeah. <laughs> it's the right thing to do. I appreciate it. I know what and, you're saying. Yeah, I, just, I would expect someone to do that for me as I well. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, but my question is actually about education, and you talked about this uh, right at the beginning, uh, about how in the, the three big hockey sticks that are yes. sort of hitting us, um, the values that we had before are sort of coming back because those are the, the most important things. Yeah. Uh, how do you sort of maintain the integrity of those values when you're sort of colliding with right. all this other stuff that's happening? And then how does that affect education? Like, does, do you disrupt right. the current system, which is obviously not keeping up? Right. Uh, or do you continue with those values, hoping that, the things, that things change based on those? Right. That's a, that's a very good question. So my favorite quote from the beginning of my book is from my uh, teacher and friend, Dove Seidman, who says, when you, um, when, you press the, uh, when you press the pause button on a computer, it stops. But when you press the pause button on a human being, it starts. That's when you start to reflect, rethink, reimagine, um, and reconnect. And so I'm a, um, I'm a big believer if we don't really pause and identify what is important and sustaining um, and not what is immediate and evanescent, um, we're going to have a real problem. And I think these values. Uh, that produce trust. So Davachi also says that trust is the only legal performance enhancing drug. Okay? So when there is trust in the room, it's like a hard floor. Boy, I can jump so high off a hard floor, but if I go out to the beach and try to jump off the sand, I can't jump a millimeter. So values that uh, build community and communities that nurture and sustain trust are the foundation of everything whether it's between teacher and student, teacher and parent, school and parent, school and community. And that's what a lot of my book is, is really about, how you create community, why that, because I believe it's the doing we do together that matters most. And, um, and these are all old time values. Uh, and I think there's this, this notion that because everything's fast and new and disrupted and, my view, it's all crap. You know, um, frankly, uh, I think all these old time values of uh, trust, decency, mutual respect, listening, deep listening, not just waiting for someone to stop talking, um, they really matter more than ever. And I think teaching those fundamentals um, is, is now more essential than ever. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, I'm a teacher. And, Where? Uh, in California. Great. Uh, and what we have found oh, since the election crazy. is a rise in hate crimes yes. and, and bullying. And it's hard for teachers uh, to impart really important lessons to our students yeah. when someone who has a, a platform and a podium is, yes, you is doing that. A, a bully. Yeah. So I want to thank you because I know that teachers often are uh, emotional pinatas when yeah. people want to blame the system for being a voice for, the, for all I of us that. to illuminate um, how difficult it is yeah. when, when there is bullies out in the yeah. world. So I want to thank you for standing thank up you. for the little guy. Appreciate and I want that. to know what we as teachers can do to, to help in, in standing up to hate crimes yeah. and bullying and, and all those things that are now an aftermath yeah. of, of this election. Well, you know, you're, it's really, thank you very much. And, and it's a really, it's, it's more important than ever. We've actually never had a bully at the bully pulpit. Mm -hmm. That's what we have, you know. And um, I grew up, I, the first lesson I learned in life was George Washington said, I cannot tell a lie, I chopped down the cherry tree. And we now have a president who basically would say, I cannot tell the truth, um, you know. And, um, uh, and, and when someone has the bully pulpit like that, it has huge effect. And uh, all you can do is, is every day just remind people um, by giving them, I think, other examples of people. It can be a Nelson Mandela. It, it, doesn't have, it, it, it can be a, 
a, a George H.W. Bush. You know, it, it can be from both sides, but people who uh, conduct their lives with integrity because, you know, um, and again, my, my uh, um, teacher at Dove Seidman says, you know, there's a big difference between formal authority and moral authority. So Trump has formal authority. He has zero moral authority. And in today's world, the real currency of leadership is moral authority. Yeah, you're in the front of the classroom and you're the formal teacher and you get to, you know, but ultimately, um, uh, whether you're a leader or whether you're a teacher, the authority that counts most in today's world is actually moral authority. Because I can see through you, I can tweet about you, I can, you know, I mean, that's really, you know, what, what prevents you from that, you know, um, is do you live the life that you're saying? Do you, um, do you have your basics and values right? That, that's what produces moral authority. And um, these are the things that really are so, uh, you know, and, and again, Dove talks about, you know, um, situational values and sustainable values. You know, everything Trump does is situational. You know, he'll say whatever he needs to in any situation, but none of it's sustainable. And right now, it's like it's all okay because the stock market's going up and there's no crisis and whatnot. But what happens when something will happen, and you know it always does, where he has to look into the TV camera and say, my fellow Americans, trust me. And that's where we'll see the real cost of this. Because we, we may, in fact, that may be the day, the one day of 364 that he tells the truth. Um, but how will we know? And so he's eroding every day his moral authority. Um, and, uh, and in a crisis, moral authority um, is what matters most in a leader or a teacher. You know, so that'd be my answer. Thank you. Time for just one or two more questions. Yeah. In the back here. Um, Thomas, my, Thomas, my name's Tony. Where um, are you from? I just want to carry on. Just Where are you from? Um, I'm Australian living in Indonesia. Huh. Um, what do you do there? Uh, education consultant. Uh, uh -huh. My question is just to follow on from that. I just want to ask you one more question about Trump. Please. Will the American democratic system, and I'm more interested in your answer about the democratic system, right, yeah. Re-elect him. So it's um, uh, it's impossible to know and to tell. You know, um, uh, he could somehow become a different person tomorrow. It's always possible in politics. Um, he could get far worse. He could get impeached. He could not. It's just impossible to predict. I wouldn't predict no. You know, we did it once. You know, we can do it again. Um, so much will be depend what the Democrats put up as an alternative. You know. Um, and so it, it's just uh, um, it's it's uh, it's just too soon to tell. Much as I'd love to think about it and wish the election were tomorrow, it's actually four years away, and so much can happen in those four years. So thank you. Back here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. My name is Jamie Lowther. I'm a Brit, and I'm a, a trustee of the Varkey Foundation. Oh, great. Um, but thank you for saying those, those points about uh, the old values. I completely agree with you on that. Can I just sort of go back to one of the things you were saying, though, which was, um, uh, which leaves me a little bit uncomfortable. Please. Is when, is when one does an analysis of, of the great events and one comes up with the sort of unifying theory, mm -hmm. uh, the, the 2007 R right. point, <clears throat> the, the grouping of, of Trump and Brexit and the Dutch election mm -hmm. and the French election, kind of the temptation is to put it all in the same bucket right. and mm -hmm. talk about populism, right. whether it's the right sort of populism or what's the wrong sort of, you know, all this sort of stuff. And I just like your, your comment about the tendency of doing that. And the illustration really is Trump is Trump and we're talking about him as a political uh, leader or, or not. Yes. Uh, and it may be just a Brit thing, but if one looks at Brexit, you know, we went into Brexit with the party in government. Right fighting yeah, hard yeah, not yeah. to go for Brexit. Right. And what other nation in the world would, would still have the same government in power afterwards and being told to implement it? Right, yeah. So it's a different analogy mm -hmm. for Trump Fair and enough, what's yeah. happening in America to, yeah. to, uh, to UK. And I've, I've waffled on enough, but I, I value your, your Appreciate view. Appreciate it, yeah. yeah. Um, 
and you're absolutely right. I mean, all of these have really local, you know, conditions. But I do think that there is a there's a common denominator of of people feeling um, uh, unmoored, uh, overwhelmed by change, and that institutions that they had counted on to cushion some of this and help them transition hadn't really uh, delivered. And that's why I think you're seeing your political parties and mine all basically blowing up in different ways. You know what I mean? Labor Party's really blown up. Um, the Democratic Party's, the truth is the Republican Party blew up. Trump was, the Republican Party was like a fallow, abandoned garden, and Trump was an invasive species. So he, he, he really pretended to be a, a Republican, but he's, he, he, he took over the host, you know, basically. And, um, uh, and so um, I, I do think that, that the reason these parties are all blowing up is because that they were designed to answer a different set of questions. The New Deal, the Industrial Revolution, the early IT revolution, and civil rights, both gender and race. And I think the questions you have to answer today as a party are how you respond to my three accelerations, how you get the most out of them and cushion the worst. And I think the EU hasn't adapted enough, the political parties haven't adapted enough, our, our local institutions haven't adapted enough. And uh, I'll get into this more tomorrow, but actually where the adaptation's happening is all at the local level. So I think the challenge of politics going forward, I think the nation state is simply too slow, paralyzed, and divided by partisanship to keep up with the pace of change. Now, we still need London and Washington, currency, defense, all of those things. I'm not saying you get rid of it, but the single family at the other end, too weak in the face of these accelerations. In my country, too many single parent families can't possibly. So I think it's gonna be the healthy community that creates the complex adaptive organism most relevant now to this era of history. And I think governing should be about pushing more and more authority down to the local level. And if you want to be an optimist about America, I can't speak for the UK, stand on your head. Oh, my country looks so much better from the bottom up than from the top down. Now, we have a lot of struggling communities, but we also have some amazing communities. Uh, come with me to Minneapolis. I'll show you 2.9% unemployment. You know. Uh, in a beautiful city, with problems, as every city does, but, but with a, a government that's a complex adaptive organism. And that, that really is where I think we have to go politically. So if I were running for office, I would be running on progressive localism. I'd be, I'd be running as a progressive localist um, and just be totally not focused on the national stuff. Thank you. Well, we've come to the end of our time this morning. I want to uh, thank you again for imparting the wisdom about both your profession you. and the world. Thank you. Fortunately, we will get to hear more from you tomorrow at, in the main plenary hall, and I encourage you all to, to come and join us then. Thank you again for, for your time.